Good morning, everyone. How are we all going? We're in week nine, so I expect everyone to be uh, <laughs> think about it, a bit a bit frazzled, lacking sleep. Um, you've put a lot of work in over the past couple of months, um, so hopefully, even if you are feeling um, feeling tired and there's still a lot of work to do because there's you know there's probably final assignments for every subject, uh, as well as exams coming up for things. Um, Stick with us, you know. You can um, you can make it through to the end. Um, if you if you need some kind of you know supportive words and stuff, you can check out my second week six lecture where I talked a lot about um, what it means to kind of manage your own workload in a sense, so that you can actually get to the point where. Um, uh, were you happy with what you've done instead of having to kind of like over pressurize yourself and end up doing worse work in a sense but you know you see uh um we're all going to react differently to different levels of pressure so hopefully everyone's finding a way to to deal with that it's like one of those things that um you never get taught explicitly in a subject at university but you get taught in the whole of university that by the end of your degree you can reach a point where you can sort of manage yourself in a sense and it, and it's weird because it's one of those things that um never goes on your transcript as such but it's it's kind of there in in the fact that you like the fact that you've learnt something you know going through going through university you kind of learn how um how to handle this kind of it's actually quite a realistic randomized pressure because <laughs> it's like oh some subjects ask you to do a lot of stuff others don't um some ask you to do a lot of stuff at the same time you don't realize that until you've taken the subjects um it's very very similar to what happens in in the workplace where it's like a company just takes on a bunch of projects and then we get halfway through the projects and realize we don't really have enough people to do them all so all of our people are just gonna have to work very very hard and you go okay i've seen this kind of situation before i accidentally took um, these three subjects at the same time and it's like okay, I have ways of dealing with this and stuff so you know if you are feeling pressure um, from having to do lots of things at once um, or even just feeling pressure from a single subject maybe comp 1511 is putting a lot of pressure on you um, and I do understand that you know I'm trying to show you as much stuff as I can in a short amount of time so um, it can feel like there's a lot. It can feel like there's there's a deluge of information coming in. Um, don't worry if it doesn't all go in. You know you can't don't have to remember everything. Um, but um, learning to get to the point where you can you can say, all right, this is how much I can learn at any one particular time. I'm going to focus on these things and less so on these other things, and just be like, okay, I'll get enough. I'll get enough out of this. So if you um, if you can reach that, reach that point where um, the the kind of the the panic response is is inevitable. It's going to happen to all of us. Um, but oh, hello! Somebody just jumped up on the desk because she heard that I was being nice to people, so she came to to get a little bit of a pat as well. Um, but yeah, if you can get to the point where you know, I think the initial response to to excessive pressure from all of us is always um, a little bit like, whoa, what's going on? But if you can get to the point where you're like, yes, okay, I understand that response and I understand that I have that response, but I've learnt ways of, of still moving on after that. Um, I think those are pretty valuable uh, and they're often things that are not taught explicitly by us as the lecturers, but they're taught... Um, just by the nature of university in of itself so it's a it's a high pressure environment um and um any kind of full-time job is is similarly going to have like it's not always but has some times of high pressure and then that kind of thing can um can be good to learn to deal with um just looking at the the chat there there are a few little questions about the exam and stuff like that the exam's all online uh next week i am going to do a bit of talking about the exam itself. Um, Matthew's asking about the DCC bug. No, turnaround time for communications that Andrew Taylor are not quite that fast. <laughs> but yes, it is an interesting issue. Uh, 
Matt brought up some interesting things about DCC because DCC is doing a lot of extra work in the background. Sometimes it slows down. Um, Leon's talking about the final exam in the afternoon. Um, yeah, so this term, the final exam is during Ramadan. So if you have any um, any issues like that that mean that you are going to have issues focusing and... Um, and working on it, please let us know, because I don't think Ramadan's the only issue that, um, that people might have. I think it's best to go through special consideration for things like that. Um, because we could do something with it, but I think it's better if it's official, and it's, a better, if, it's better if the university knows about it, because then they can just say, oh, here's a policy, because it's like, you're obviously not the only person uh, celebrating Ramadan at the moment, so there's going to be, like, uh, a lot of people who need to, um, is it celebrating or observing? I'm not sure. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of people who need something, so the university will figure out something and go, okay, everyone there is going to be doing it at a different time or something like that. Um, Jesse was asking, what happens if you submit the lab homework late? Do you still get marks for it? This is an interesting one because any lab stuff that you do that's um, past the due date, you, still, you can still get up to 75% of the marks for it. Um, this is our way of saying, we know that a lot of people are going to go back and want to do the labs that they've missed um, during the four or five days that you have to study. It's pretty short because the exams are really early. Um, but even so, um, we want to give you marks for it because we think it's valuable for you to do it if you haven't done it before. Or even if you have done it before and you want to improve your marks. Hard to improve if you can only get maximum 75%, but still, for some people that is going to work. So the lab marks are still going to give you marks if you want to do them in the study period and stuff. Not maximum though, but like, cause we do, we do want to encourage you to do it out at the time it happens. But there's an old proverb, old proverb that says, um, the best time to plant a tree is, is 50 years ago. I don't know if it's exactly 50, but you know, the best time to plant a tree is 50 years ago. The second best time is now. So if you haven't done the labs at the time that we taught things and stuff, which is the sequence that we do to try to get people, you know, current on what's happening. If you haven't done it then, now is still a good time to do it, and there's nothing wrong with doing it now. Um, you can still learn a lot from, from going back and catching up on lab exercises and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and Joanna's answering that question as well. All right, let's move into the actual lecture for today. Um, what did we learn last week? I'll put my face here on the... Uh, wait, which, which angle is it? Yeah, there you go. There's my um, <laughs> conspiracy conspiracy theory guy talking about linked lists. So last week we finished our three lecture sequence on linked lists. So we ended up with a complete working implementation of a linked list program. Um, that was our Battle Royale program. And the cool thing about that is we had the capability of memory allocating and creating nodes um, making them into a list. Uh, we improved on making them into the list by being able to insert them into um, uh, into different parts of the list. And we showed one example of an uh, of a function that would um, insert on base on, on certain conditions. And so we did it with alphabetical order conditions, but you could do you could have done it with something like numerical order. Um, you could have done it with something like or I don't know, insert at the end of the list. <laughs> just to, you know, just to give away one of the techniques you could use for the assignment. Um, you, you, there was part of the code there, if you look at it carefully and you understand it and you can edit it, you could use that for inserting a node at the end of a list. Um, and then there's the removal of nodes, which we, um, which we did in a similar way by, by saying, okay, let's look for a specific condition and when we find that specific condition, we will remove a node. So a lot of this stuff, and, and I encourage you going back and working on linked lists, working on linked lists in the tutorials and labs, um, as well as um, working on them in the assignment and the exam, and your future computing career, if you want to keep going, these things don't go away, obviously, um, uh, is, is thinking about drawing pictures. So it's, it's really funny because, we, like, you know, people go, oh, why would I... Or I draw pictures on paper and stuff like that. Like, I stopped doing that when I was, like, five years old or something. And it's like, oh, no. <laughs> Those of us who have worked on these kinds of theoretical structures 
um, deep into professional careers and stuff, we have whiteboards in our offices, you know, and we use those whiteboards a lot when we're thinking about these things. Um, so the idea that we're drawing pictures like this guy here is linking up all of these different nodes of, of random news reports that he thinks have some kind of connection to each other. Um, he's obviously drawing pictures on the wall, and so that's why he thinks he can understand it. Um, linked lists are the same. <laughs> linked lists are basically conspiracy. Th no. Um, if, you, if you draw pictures of them, you're going to understand the theory and the abstract of what you're trying to do, uh, and then it makes it much easier for you to then take those things and translate them uh, into uh, the code that actually moves pointers around and stuff like that. Uh, we also looked at cleaning up after ourselves. We did that in the removal of nodes, but we also added a function that was capable of cleaning up an entire list if we needed. So a lot of that stuff um, is things that I consider very, very useful for working with linked lists, um, very, very useful for working with structures and memory allocation and stuff like that. All this stuff's quite valuable. Um, all this stuff is going to come back again in computer science. So um, it's good to at least get a look at it now, even if you don't think you have full control over pointers and memory allocation and stuff, still good um, to have a look at it now and try to get some practice. <laughs> Someone said, will game development require linked lists? Lol. Game development requires way more than linked lists. Like, a linked list is so, so basic uh, compared to what we use in game development. Um, in game development, we usually have things like a massive chunk of nodes, and each node has like eight pointers coming off it to a bunch of different nodes. And then traversing the list is not just looping through a one dimensional thing. It's like this spreading growth of looking through possible futures and stuff like that. So yeah, if, you, <laughs> if you're wondering if you ever wanna do, um, you can look up things like finite state machines and stuff like that. We definitely use them in, in game development. Anyway, let's move on to what we're doing today. I don't need to, I don't need to explode your mind with, uh, uh, <laughs> with a with a complete look at at all of the ideas of what's going on with game development. So I'm going to let Joanna answer the questions because I've got a lot to talk about today. Today we are looking at abstract data types. Now I have been hinting at this stuff all the way through the linked list um, exercise, especially when I decided, I think in the second lecture that we were going to do the linked list uh, exercise on um, uh, with a multi-file project, and I started using the type def and stuff like that. Um, I'm going to talk more about that today, a little bit of recap of how that works, as well as an example of how we use ab these abstract data types. Like, we've been using them already. Like, you know, there's a lot of a lot of things in, in 1511, you should be familiar with it now, where I show you something and just use it, and I don't really explain the background of it, and then I go deeper later once you've got a, a, a kind of contextual understanding of it. So, now that you've seen a multi-file project, you've actually seen two, because your assignment is one as well, um, we can talk about how this separation works and, and how it's useful to us. Okay. So, um, we have talked about this before. We can give someone the capability to use something that we've created without giving them full control over it. So we give them access to certain functions and we use those functions to, in a sense, protect uh, the information that we're, um, uh, that we're working on. So let's continue. A recap of our multi-file projects and how they're structured. So we have a header file. So each of these, we're going to call these abstract data types. These are the, um, the types that we've created using our little type def thing, and we put them in their own file. So they're kind of protected in their own file, but they also are, they give access to other things using their header file. So each of these abstract data types is gonna have its own H and C file, a header file and an implementation file. Um, and the separation, we've kind of seen of these before. There's not much code in the header file. There's a lot of comments um, and there's function definitions, uh, declarations. I just get declarations and definitions like mixed up because they start with the same letters. So the declaration is just the, the what we call the prototype as well, which is just the thing that says these are the inputs and outputs, no more information. So the header file is gonna have that kind of stuff in it. And then the implementation is gonna have the actual code that runs. So when we call the function, 
and we know what the function's name is via the header, but we don't get to the working code of the function unless we look at the, at the C file. Any other files, if they want to use um, the abstract data type that we have, they will include the header so they know what the functions are and they know what the name of the abstract data type is. So the nice thing about splitting these things up is that we don't overcomplicate ourselves. So what we do is we go, all right, I have this batch of functions and I'm just going to use those batch of functions. I don't need to know the details. I just need to know which functions I can call to get my work done. Um, so that's viewing it from the outside. Um, and then viewing it from the perspective of creating the C file, you've got this header file that, that gives you a set of instructions. It's kind of like, um, this function must do this, this function must do this, this function must do, th do this. And you don't think about the context of trying to chain it all together into a massive program. All you do is you say, this function has to do this. I don't have to think about anything else. I'll implement that function. Then I move on to the next function. And I say, okay, that function needs to do something. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to work on that now. And it allows us to kind of take our, <laughs> our limited capability meat brains and say, you only have to think about one thing at a time. And humans are much better at only having to think about one thing at a time. A computer would be able to say, all right, okay, I can see all of these things at once. I can make sure I never make any mistakes, you know, um, because basically every mistake a computer makes is something that a human has written into it in a sense like you know we always complain about programs because they're not working and stuff like that it's usually human error in that and um, abstract data types are going to help us a lot with reducing human error okay so when we want to use all the files together we need to link them uh, linking is actually a technical term there is a part of our compilers called a linker and the linker is the thing that reads these hash includes and stuff and allows us to um, call a function that we only know the name of but we know has been compiled somewhere else in our program so those unique names that we use for our functions um, those are kind of attached to each other in the final program so that if our main calls a function you can actually find the code that was compiled from the c files the only reason it knows what the name is is because it did the hash include on the header file um, so the way that we kind of remember this is that the only way that h files make it into our project is via hash includes so headers are included and the only way that C files ever make it into our project is that they're compiled. C files are never included, header files are included, C files are compiled. So once you, once you, you get that separation, you start to get some experience with the, the H and C concept, then you can get, uh, you can get this, this kind of like combined project thing, uh, connected. And it gets really interesting once you start, you know, uh, hash including you know four or five files at once and stuff you have these larger projects that are like okay I take this capability from this abstract data type take a capability from this other one um, I've got these two or three includes from the standard library which are basically like abstract data types as well where you go okay these things have this capability and we're going to use it that kind of thing um, yeah so once you get get a feel for that you can see how um, we can separate our programs into these bite-sized chunks that we can actually uh, work on without having to um, um, without having to think too much about what's inside all of them at once um, and you can see how what I've been teaching you about problem solving applies very well to this idea of the um, abstraction to push things into separate files. Because one of the big things I said about problem solving is break this down into smaller manageable parts and then try to solve only those problems at a time. And we're, we're physically doing this now, well not physically, it's all digital, but you know, doing this now by splitting these problems up into different files. Okay, so an example of this that you may have seen, uh, I hope everyone's seen it. <laughs> I will remind you of the proverb that, <laughs> that the best time to start this was a week ago, the second best time is now. Um, I mean, even if you start the, the, the assignment now, you still do have a week and a half. So you still have time to complete it, but I would suggest that um, <laughs> there's not many more days where I'm gonna say you still got time to complete this. <laughs> 
Next week, I'm not going to say you still have time to complete this. Next week, I will say you should hurry up and get started on this um, because it's worth a lot of marks. You see, the, the, the way I speak about it will change as we go along. Okay, so we've got a good example here of an abstract data type. So we've got your beats.h and your beats.c. So your beats.h says we've got hash defines, we've got type defs. Do we have more than one type def? Yeah, I think so. Uh, and oh, I'm not sure if we've type def both the track and the beat there. Um, but anyway, we've got um, function declarations, and these are the important bits where, like, the way I've talked about this before is if we had two people working on this project, one people would be working on the main uh, of this and another person would be working on the C file of this. But the H file in between is something that we've spent some time on. You know, before we started implementing other things, we sat down and we said, what should be the crossover point between these? So beats is supposed to provide some functionality to the main function and the main, not, not just the main function, the main file in a sense. And the main is going to run the program itself. So we say, what things should this be able to do? Um, well, it's supposed to be like a music synthesizer. So it's supposed to have time points and every time point is supposed to know which notes it's going to play. If you get really complicated, uh, which we obviously didn't do here, you'd have different instruments playing at different times, um, and each instrument might be able to play multiple notes, and then we'd end up with, like, at the moment we've got this kind of two-dimensional linked list, we'd end up with, like, a three- or four-dimensional kind of thing, and things would get complicated, we didn't need to do that to teach you about linked lists here. But the beats.h is something we would probably agree on in advance, or if we added functionality to the program, we would come together and talk about it kind of thing. Whereas um, the beats.c, one person would be working on that and what they would be doing is um, putting together the actual code underneath that runs what happens in beats.h. The interesting thing about this is whoever's working on the main doesn't have to know what's in beats.c. All they have to do is trust that what was defined in beats.h will be able to be created. Um, and then what's in um, what it, what's in beats.c, we're going to trust that whoever's implementing this is going to do it in, in a way that matches what we'd said in advance about beats.h. And this is the reason why um, we gave you a, a taste of this in these actual files. Um, that's why this, it's so heavily commented in beats.h because it can't just be the function name we have to talk really clearly about exactly what this function is going to do so that one person who's in the C file, this is you in this example, <laughs> in the assignment, knows um, what exactly each function is supposed to do. And then whoever's writing the main file, so we could say that could be, you can even think of that as me writing the main file. I'm just a couple of weeks uh, earlier in the project um, that I had a chance to write the main file before you'd even seen the H file. Um, what I've written, it's not actually me personally, um, one of the tutors wrote this one, but you could think of what I wrote for the main.c is um, an interactive application that uses um, the beats abstract data type to, um, um, to, to interactively put together some music stuff. So what I wrote in a sense is all this code that, um, that handles input and um, um, and talking to the user, input and output and stuff like that, and then holds together a, a particular structure, but that's about all. Um, so when we're looking at the files itself, the main includes the beats.h and then uses the functions in it. So with the three of them there, beats.h is the interface. It's the thing in between the two other files that says these are the functions that are available. The C is the thing that contains all the working stuff. And then the main is another file that uses that one. And as your projects get bigger, as you get deeper into computer science, you're going to use this kind of pattern, um, but you can have more and more files. So your main might not be the only file. There might be this kind of structure of things going on where the main's there and there's like eight other files you've written and all these other bits and pieces that join together and, and eventually are all sort of included into the main and then the main uses um, all of these capabilities to get stuff done. So I've, I've thrown around the word abstract data types a fair bit. Um, there's a lot of chat going on. Uh, I'm, I'm going to assume that Joanna's got it because Joanna's 
obviously I can see typing a lot. All right, it looks like you're helping everyone out with um, assignment stuff and stuff like that. Okay, so I talked about abstract data types. Now I'm gonna talk about ex specifically what an abstract data type is. So these are types in a sense, in the same way that an integer is a type of variable, a, um, a double is a type of variable, a pointer is a type of variable, and a struct is a custom variable. An abstract data type is um, also a type, but it's not just a type of variable. It goes beyond um, being just a way of storing information, that all other variables are just a way of storing information. When we get to abstract data types, we start to add on top of the idea of storing information. I mean, generally an abstract data type will store information in some way, but on top of that, it is also going to um, specify how it's used. So it's not just storing information, it's also kind of a set of rules. So we'll give them a name, but these rules fix how we're going to work with them. So this is how we're going to interact with the data type. So if you look at beats, um, and you look at the linked list inside, inside beats, we don't let our main just poke all the way into the linked list and make changes. If we wanna add a note or remove a note or, or change which beat we're currently focusing on and stuff like that, we don't want um, another part of the program to be able to poke into our sensitive data and make changes there. So we can pr protect the data to say that, okay, if you would like to do something within the rules of the program, what we will do is we'll provide a function for you so that you can use this. Um, and the other thing we do, which is interesting, is um, you don't see what's going on underneath the abstract data type. This is the idea that um, it is kind of abstract. It is not concrete versus, you know, abstract versus concrete, if you think of that concept, is that we, we don't specify in the abstract data type exactly how it's built. All we need to do is say, here are the rules, and if you're going to build something that, that makes this abstract data type work, so implements this abstract data type, um, then you will, you will need to make sure that your implementation follows these rules. Um, if you're going to use this abstract data type, so this is the same concept I've been talking about. If you're gonna use it, you don't need to know how it was built, all you need to do is assume that it follows the rules and then the builder built it to follow the rules, the, the user uses it following the rules. And if that all works out, which it usually does once we've built things correctly, um, then the abstract data type can exist and work. So you can kind of tell why I didn't start talking about this until we'd already built one. It's a bit fiddly. So the type def, we've, we've looked at the type def before, but I didn't actually put together like, you know, a, a, a really official slide on it. But a type def is actually a really, really simple concept in terms of what it does in our program. So it's a single line of code that just does one thing. And it's a really, really simple thing. It just says this thing is the same as something else. So what I do is like, let's say I've created this, um, a struct called library. Um, and what I've said is there's one type here, which is a pointer to a library structure. So I've made a struct library somewhere in my program. The type def doesn't actually have to know where because all pointers are just 64 bit memory addresses. So it doesn't need to know anything more about this to be able to do this type def, but it says a struct library pointer. So a pointer to that particular variable type can be called capital L library. And this is a convention that we use. We use capitals for the for the type name that we're creating out of this um, uh, initial original type that I call it here. The capital reminds us that this thing is not one of our normal types. So it's not like the lowercase integer or double or even the structs and stuff like that. The capital reminds us that this, this thing is a concept, uh, not a not a specific programming implementation. So it's nearly like this is an idea. Um, and that idea is something that we're going to use without knowing anything more underneath it. So it's, it's an idea that we're going to trust in a sense. Um, so we will usually put the type def in the header file, which means that 
anyone who wants to use this concept is going to include the header file and if they include the header file then they're going to know um, uh, they're going they're, they're going to know at least what the name of this object is the interesting thing that the type def does is it hides away the idea of the truth behind the object so um, it means that the the idea this library and its structure is hidden so let me let me just like I made this up, right? So there is no implementation behind this. I just made up the, the word for this. So, but let's just think of a hypothetical is the, the library was something for organizing books in, in our book collection. So I could have all of my books as individual structs and I could have my library as a large array that just contained all of these books. Or I could have my library as a large linked list that contains all of the books that I own. Um, the trick about it is if all I can see is the header file and the capital L library, I don't know which one it is. I don't know if it's an array or a linked list, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the rules of the library, which is something like, oh, did you add a book to the library? Um, did you borrow a book from the library and did you return a book from the library? You know, I could make those functions, but what I would never do is give someone access to the data itself. I would say, no, no, you don't have access to all the books in the library. If you would like to read one, you can use the borrow function and then you can get that book out of the library. Um, if you um, if you want to add to the library, you can you can use a function that would add something to the library. If you want to remove a book entirely from the library, you can have another function to do that. But at no point are you allowed to look into the data structure and do things because the library itself will implement its own rules about how we're going to add and remove um, things from the library. And we don't want someone just poking into the data. So, I'm starting to repeat myself here. <laughs> Hopefully the concept is starting to sit though, right? So, the type def goes in the header, but this means that people can see the type and they can even use the type, but they will never know exactly what's inside it. And if you really, really want to look, you can go look in the C file where the details are, but if you want to use it without looking, you, you can just do that as well. So, um, the header file is going to also just provide a, a list of functions in a sense that's going to say, okay, these are the things that you can do. And then it'll be interesting because whenever we create a header file, there'll be certain things we allow the, the user. It's not really the user, but it's the other part of the program, the main part of the program. Um, there'll be certain things that we allow that part of the program to do. But there's also certain things we explicitly leave out. So there's things that we're going to say, like, I think um, one of the examples of a multi-file project I did was the person, like, adding superpowers to Batman, I think I was doing. And there was a specific set of rules where it's like, yes, you can add a superpower, but you can't actually take any powers away. I mean, it's like kind of ironic that they use Batman, who technically doesn't have any superpowers. But, you know... A little bit of fun anyway um, and there were specific functions that allowed you to do certain things but there was no function that allowed you to say go in and change the order of the powers and stuff like that and if you had access full access to the implementation so it wasn't abstracted behind this type you wouldn't be able to do that so there's a lot of things where we control what can and can't be done So I want to show you an example of a simple abstract data type. This is a pretty basic thing, but it's something we actually use a lot in programming. You've been using this all term without necessarily knowing it. Um, and this is a stack. So stack is a, is a data structure. So it's a way of organizing our information. But the way it works is it has like one simple rule. And the simple rule is this concept, last in, first out. So last in, first out means the most recent thing that you've added to the data structure. So let's consider that um, a, a stack is like a deck of cards. We're going to build it later as a deck of cards. So if I have a deck of cards, I don't have a deck of cards hand. Oh, sorry, I'm not going to go searching in all my... <laughs> my games around me to, to, to find a deck of cards. But if I have a deck of cards, I put a card on top. 
And if I put a card on top and then draw a card, it's going to be the same card that I just put there. And if I put several cards on top, the most recent one is the one that I'm going to draw back off it. So you can think of it physically as, as a deck of cards, a stack. Um, um, so the most recent thing we've placed on top of it is the next thing that comes off it. So, and, and everything underneath is going to maintain the order in it. So this is the idea of the last thing that went in is the first thing that comes out. The other things about the rules of a stack is, yes, we can put something on top of the stack, we can remove something on top of the stack, but we cannot access anything underneath it. So I can't just go, oh, I'm going to cut the deck and grab these random things from inside. Like, that's not allowed in this particular set of rules. So it's like, no, you can only interact with what's on top of the stack. And I said a second ago that this is something that we've been using in programming a lot. So let me show you. This is how functions work. The programs we've been running actually have a stack that is running as, as our, our program is running. So this is this thing called a call stack. Um, I'm not sure how deep everyone has been going into um, debugging and error messages and stuff like that, but the term call stack may have actually come up before. Um, someone said stack overflow. Stack overflow is the call stack. So the call stack is what code is running right now. So let me step through this example because it's, it's kind of interesting, right? When our main function is running, the main function goes onto the call stack. So the call stack's actually a piece of memory we use to manage our programs. So the main function goes onto the call stack. The main function is currently the only thing in the stack. It is the top of the stack. So when we add something, it goes to the top of the stack, right? And so this is the only thing we have access to. So we're running stuff in our main. The main then calls function one. So this is just some other function. I didn't name these specifically. I just thought of let them be whatever. So when it calls a function, that function gets added to the call stack. Adding the function to the call stack makes it the top thing on the call stack. Now the interesting thing is when we call another function, we cannot access our main anymore. We are not running any of the instructions in the main. We are only running the instructions inside this function. And, and remember, when we call another function, we cannot access any of the variables that are inside the main either. So this is no longer the top of the stack not accessible. So only the stuff that's in function one is accessible. So it has its own variables, which may be a copy of these variables. If it has pointers, then yes, it can access anything outside of it. But otherwise, we're, we're stuck with only being able to work with the top of the stack. Function one then calls another function. We'll call it function two. Function two gets added to the stack. Based on the rules of the stack, the function two always gets added to the top of the stack. That is the only place that an item can get added to the stack. And then when function two is on top of the stack, we cannot access anything underneath it in the stack. We can only access the top of the stack, right? And so then we're using function two and we're going, okay, we're running all of the instructions in function two. We cannot run any of the instructions from function one or main. They don't keep going when the other function runs, right? So when we call another function, it runs until it finishes. And then when it finishes, it gets removed from the stack. Um, stack actually has its own set of words, like push and pop. You push things onto the stack and you pop things off the stack. So this gets popped off the stack. And then once it's gone, we look at the stack itself and we say, okay, what's on top of the stack? What's on top of the stack was the function that called function two. And so function two will return and maybe it'll give some information back to, to function one, but we're not really worried about the information at the moment. We're worried about who has control. And so function two disappears, and then function one says, oh, now I'm the top of the stack because there's nothing, there's nothing here. And so we will continue running anything that's in function one. So this is exactly the kind of flow of a program that we've seen working already. It's like the main calls the function, the function has to complete its running before we can go back to the main. And if it calls another function, that function has to complete before we return to this function and so on and so forth. And the stack is how that's controlled. So we just keep adding things to the stack as we call more functions. And we keep removing things from the stack as, as those functions return and complete. You can even think of this if you just look at like every... Um, Every program you've written that has any kind of curly brackets in it, the curly brackets are stacks in a sense. So every time we open the curly bracket, we're, we're adding a new new scope section of, of our code kind of onto a stack where that's the thing that we'll be running. And then when the close bracket happens, we go back 
to to the rest of the code that was running. So we can nearly think of those as a stack as well. Not quite as explicitly as this, because when you have curly brackets, you can still access other part of your parts of your program. But with these functions, it's really explicit, right? And, and it's actually built with this this stack idea. Uh, so yeah, so this is this is an interesting thing where like we're, we're hitting that point in comp one five one one where I'm never showing you anything <laughs> that you haven't actually already seen. Um, but I like to kind of subliminally allow you to absorb a whole bunch of information then later on go, okay, so see the thing that we've been using this whole time. It actually has a formal concept. It has an idea, and this is what it means, and this is why you can trust it. So if we can trust this stack to give us only access to the thing on top, and the only thing we can do is anytime we add something, it goes on top, and then when, whenever we remove something, we can only remove the thing that's off the top of the stack, then you can see how we use a stack structure to just completely trust um, how functions work. So all of our function calls and returns are going to work really nicely like that. Um, it's like discussion. Ooh, people are going really deep and then talking about uh, compilers and stuff like that. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, um, there's a lot of discussion in there about object-oriented programming and stuff like that. We're not going deep into object-oriented programming just yet. Uh, this stuff is abstraction, which if, if, you, if you want to get really official about it, it's only one quarter of, of, of the concept that people call object-oriented programming, which is something that was really, really huge uh, around, I'm going to say around the turn of the century. So it's, it's a little bit old, the concept, but I mean... A lot of programming concepts are thousands of years old. Like the idea of a linked list is a mathematical graph and node structure. So it's thousands, thousands, maybe thousands of years. Old. I don't know how old, but yeah, it's really old. And then we're we're just working with it. So even though object-oriented programming is a little bit long in the tooth um, these days, there's still a lot that we're going to learn from it. But don't worry too much if you've never heard of the term, and I'm not even really going to talk about it here. I'm just going to talk about abstract data types, which are pretty useful. But anyway, the discussion in there was just a little bit about um, uh, object-oriented programming there. And I think that people talking about 2511 as being a course that has uses Java and teaches you more about that. So the idea of abstraction is going to come back in the future. As you know, this is an introductory course. So what I'm going to do is to introduce you to lots and lots of different parts of computer science. Like, you know, half a slide, I went into the detail about... Um, the hardware of computers but that was like really a, a, an overview in a sense this is a real overview of how compilers organize our program as it runs you want to get deeper into this stuff compilers and operating systems and stuff like that is is where that that happens okay so i said abstract data types and i said the stack and now let's talk about why this is an abstract data type so the stack is is an idea it's a concept it is not a concrete definition. All it says is if you add something, it should add to the top. Uh, if you remove something, it should remove from the top. You cannot access anything underneath that. So the idea that it works in, um, uh, in the way our programs are run is something that's useful, but we don't know how it's implemented. So is the call stack in our program an array or a linked list? I don't even know because I haven't looked that closely at the compilers and stuff. Um, if you, I'm not sure. Some of your tutors might know this depending on which subjects they've taken, but this is not something that's, that's definitely not one of my areas of expertise. And it's interesting because I've been using call stacks professionally for, for you know, for decades, you know, use them to debug programs and stuff like that and, and really like delve into them. But in C, I do not know how it's implemented and I don't need to know because it's an abstract concept. So it's an idea. So we can think of things like, you know, if I wanted to have a collection of objects um, and I asked you to think about how to build a collection of objects, um, everyone would be split immediately between probably one of these two. I mean, some people are going to gonna try to be smart and come up with another way of doing it. That's fine if you want to. But most of us are going to say um, the collections of objects that we've learned about so far are arrays or linked lists. So we go, okay, we're going to go with an array or a linked list to um to implement this stack but the stack doesn't care and i think that's an interesting thing about it right is it just says i'm an idea that data should be organized in a particular way 
I do not care exactly how it's implemented. I just think it should be organized with a set of rules. Right. So the stack, the abstract data type itself does not say how it's built. It just says what rules it has to follow. Um, and then when we are going to start actually building something like this, like the abstract data type, we can have a header file that says these are the rules so we can implement those rules so we can say you can push to the stack you can pop off the stack you can build a new stack you know stuff like that um and the implementation that's in the c file could use say arrays or linked lists i'm going to use these examples today um to to control the objects and then each of its functions will be related specifically to the data type it used but we don't necessarily know so we don't know from the outside which one's going to be used. We just trust that it follows the rules of the stack. So we're going to actually build that. I can't remember if I've got more slides to talk about before we build it, but I think we're going to, yeah, we're going to go into, okay, so we're going to take an early break um, and then we'll come back and we'll do load coding for the second half because what I'm going to try to squeeze in today is building a stack abstract data type. I'm not going to do it completely, but I'm going to do one implementation as a linked list and another implementation as an array. And you'll see that once we run them, uh, we won't really know which one we're running at any time because the abstract data type just says, now both of these implementations follow the rules. You don't have to know which one it is. In the same way that if I take two students who have completed uh, CS beats, let's just say they're at the same level of completion. So they've both completed stage one. Um, and I run it, I shouldn't be able to tell the difference of how someone's coded something. Um, I should be able to say, I run this. I mean, like, assuming that you've... <laughs> assuming everything's correct. Um, if everything's not correct, then I can tell the difference between your code. But otherwise, um, you could have two compiled programs, um, and I run them from the main, and I won't know whose is whose, even though they have completely different implementations in them. Like, sure, a lot of the implementations are going to be identical because it's, it's linked lists and stuff, but you're going to have your own way of writing. Everyone's going to have their own kind of um, way they like to approach, say, looping or something like that, the way they like to approach data manipulation and things. So if I looked at your code, it'd be like, these are two obviously different pieces of code. But then when I write them, uh, when, I, when I actually run them, um, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference because on the other side of the abstract data type... Um, I can only see the the abstraction of it and I can say well I trust this and this seems to work um, so we're gonna get into that but before we go into break I just want to talk a little bit about programming languages and I love it right because like people are talking about programming languages in the YouTube chat right now and so it's perfect that I happen to have a, a slide here about this uh, it's nearly like I have structured <laughs> <laughs> the way we do this entire subject to get you thinking about certain things at certain times. So I'm glad all this talk of abstraction makes people think that what if what if the thing on the other side of the abstract data type is not even in a language? Oh, it's not even in the language we're using. C is quite capable of actually running other programs in a sense. Like you can call Python code from within C and vice versa and all these other things like that. So it could be like this abstract data type is just like literally implemented in a different system. Um, it gets fiddly, it gets really fiddly if you try to do that, but it's possible, right? But I want to talk about different programming languages, right? Because we've got C++, Java, C Sharp. These are some of the big ones. I mean, C++ and Java. Java especially is one of the biggest languages in the world at the moment. Um, I could say Python as well, but I, I just wanted to say these at the moment are based directly on C. So these are like second generation C, um, C-based languages. I mean, Python, I would probably... Like, I probably argue to a certain extent is a C-based language. Um, I'm, t I'm thinking about the way that it is written and the way that it is understood. Um, if you were to go learn Python now, you would see that everything you've learnt about um, algorithms and ideas and, and, and just sort of general program structures, you can apply to other languages really easily. So I want to say that there's a lot of programming languages. Um, uh, everyone, whenever we start talking about programming languages, likes to talk about, you know, which ones are their favorite or um, bring up these esoteric languages that no one knows about and go, well, this language is going to be the language of the future. And it's like, okay, let's wait and see on that one. You know, there are too many programming languages 
to genuinely learn. I said there's too many programming languages to count. That's probably not true. I assume that you can count. <laughs> like, mathematically speaking, the uncountable things are not programming languages. Programming languages is something you can count. But there's a lot of them just sort of being made and things like that. There is no just kind of single repository in the world of all the programming languages. So there's, there's just, like, f like, feasibly there's too many of them. So what I want to say to everyone is it's not as important um, to learn specific languages as it is to to learn the the concept that I was teaching you at the sort of the very beginning of the course is the idea that programming is talking to computers and if you can talk to computers you can actually talk to them in many many different languages it's just a matter of seeing how what you want to say to your computer uh, works in other languages so there's lots of different programming languages but the idea is that if you have your plans, you have your way of thinking, you have your way of saying, okay, this is what I would like the computer to do, you can actually eventually be able to use basically any programming language because um, each one of them is going to be a matter of like, okay, let's just get some of the grammar and syntax and then, um, then we'll find our way around it. So that's what I'm trying to teach you is that um, there's a reason why this course does not mention C in its title. Um, it is Introduction to Programming Fundamentals, and it's about programming, not necessarily about C. We happen to have done everything in C, but I would have an expectation that anyone who passes this course um, would have a significantly easier time picking up other languages, languages other than C after this course than before. So if you wanted to teach yourself Python, uh, after this course, it would be very easy. You want to teach yourself Java after this course, it would be very easy compared to what it was like before you learned the course. So that's what I'm trying to trying to try to push forward the idea that what we're teaching you is not um, how to write C, but it's how to write programs and how to learn about programs, how to solve problems, how to plan uh, and design programs. And the language is only like a small part of that. You know, it's only like sort of twenty percent of what we need to know. Okay, let's go on break. It's about 11.50 now, 11.51, I guess. Um, but we'll come back at 11.55, and we're going to go through, and we're going to uh, implement a stack in a couple of different ways.
All right, we're back. Um, some really, really interesting, interesting discussion going on about, like, you know, what happens after we learn our first language? And I'm glad people are thinking about that. And this is also why this slide is here, is because people are starting to think about, like, okay, 1511 is nearly over. Where do we go from here? People talking about learning other languages. Um, and the interesting idea that some other languages introduce concepts that we haven't learned about yet. And so those languages will be really good to learn alongside other concepts. So um, someone mentioned Haskell. Uh, functional programming languages are really, really interesting um, because they don't work with the same concept of this like line by line execution that we've been doing. And it's really good to wrap your head around that. Um, if you're interested in those things, Friday's lecture is going to be super interesting for you. I'm actually bringing Tom in for Friday's lecture, give him a chance to do some guest lecturing. Uh, we're going to be talking about the concept of recursion. Um, and this is the first time we've talked about this, but recursion is programming backwards. Um, very, very interesting. Um, not something that we we're teaching as like a super core concept for 1511 because it's just an alternative way of coding. Uh, but it's really interesting because it, it flips your your concept of how movement, how how the program moves through its own code. So yeah, but you know, we'll talk about that later. Um, and also people talking about the idea of like, you, you could potentially uh, not necessarily have to like branch out and learn other programming languages, but just um, learn more concepts and just apply them in this same programming language. So for example, if we just use C and we don't use any other languages, there is so much we haven't talked about you know, in terms of programming, like we've, we've barely scratched the surface on a lot of these things. Like someone asked earlier about game development um, and, and how we would use linked lists in game development. The simplest thing is I could say is a, a linked list is an inventory, right? And so we use the linked list for inventory because inventory increases and decreases in size a lot of the time. Like there are times where you definitely use an array for inventory doing things like if you ever played Diablo where it's like the array is a square grid and you have to like basically play Tetris with all your pieces of equipment to fit them all in there and it's like oh it's obviously that's a 2D array um but there's other things which just like no I'm just I just have a list of things and you're like oh well, that's obviously going to be a linked list behind the scenes um but there's heaps of other stuff when we talk about walking around on waypoints and stuff like that where we have nodes which are positions and paths in between them which are pointers in a sense and then we have one node like the major city has like 10 roads coming out of it those are all pointers to other places that you could go to um and so we take the concept of linked list and we explode it into this massive kind of set of possibilities and that kind of thing anyway let's let's learn our basics before we get in over our heads um but i do i do like that a lot of people are starting to think about the future because 1511 is not going to be with you for very much longer um and there's a lot more to learn in the world i'll talk more about that next week when we wrap up the course and stuff but for now we're looking at abstract data types so we're going to build a stack so when we build a stack the first thing we're going to think about is how we're going to use it uh, we're not going to think about whether it's an array or a linked list yet that is that is further down the line the first thing we need to think about is like how is this thing going to work so what is the functionality that it has so i'm going to do simple things so a stack of integers um, i'm not going to do a stack of programs <laughs> and 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 thinking about managing their code as well as the memory for their variables and stuff like that that's a very very complex task but if i'm just going to do a stack of integers i should be able to um to build something that has a specific capability so we can give access to the stack via specific functions. We can make a stack, we can destroy a stack, we can um, add something to the stack, which is the push, remove something from the stack, which is, which is the pop, and we have another function that counts how many things are in the stack. So maybe we wanna know how many, how many things are underneath us in the stack. Or more often, we just need to know if there is anything in the stack or not. So these might be my basic functions that I'm going to use for this. And here is a, a header file I could use. So I have some kind of internals. I have not said what they are. I just know someone else is going to have to deal with them. Um, but the capital S stack is the thing I'm going to use. So creating a stack, I'm going to create an empty stack. I've actually put the void keyword in here. You don't need this. This could be in empty brackets. Um, sometimes I like to put it in there to just remind myself that this is definitely empty. Um, 
if I'm going to free the stack, I'm going to need to know which stack I'm freeing, and obviously I don't get anything back because I'm going to destroy everything in this. So this is the make and destroy the entire stack. Um, push and pop is going to add something to the stack, so you need to know which stack you're manipulating at each time, and then the number that's adding to the stack or the number that just got removed from the stack. Uh, and then we have another one which says, what's the size of the stack? So these are exactly these functions. Um, and they have basically that much information in them, right? All they've got is inputs and outputs. We don't have anything else going on. Let me... Actually, don't need to go there. Let me go into VLAB. So, here's one I prepared earlier. 15? Yes. Yep. Oh, you can tell I prepared it earlier because the backup file has, has me editing it. Um, I'm going to open these two files. Not going to look at the main yet. Um, the main's not that important, although I've left it there as if someone else wrote it, some, some guy called Mark. He didn't leave his email address in either of these. We'll have to edit that. Um, but we look at the H file. And this is one that I've just edited recently. It has more information than the one in the slides because I don't have that much space in the slides. Um, but it has the same functions. So create and destroy, uh, push to add an item, pop to remove an item, and something to query the stack size. So these are the rules that the stack is going to follow. My main is going to be testing these like it's a deck of cards. And I'm wondering why gedit in particular yeah, it's just Gia that sometimes just freezes up on me. Might have to talk to our systems people about that. There might be something in my 1511 setup that, that's causing problems there. Anyway, so I could create a deck of cards and have a card and add that card to the top of the deck. Actually, I might make these closer to card numbers. Oh, actually, there's just random numbers. Cards with random numbers, that's fine. Um, so we add this card to the top of the deck, I say what I'm doing, I add this card, change the number, add a different card to the top of the deck, add the card to the top of the deck, and then what I can say is these are the cards I'm taking off the deck. So this is the thing I'm going to be using to test my code, and it's really similar to like in the assignment how we have a main, func a main function with a whole lot of stuff in it which you could use to test your code. But that's all I've got so far, I've got a stack.h and a main.c, and so I haven't actually implemented the stack itself. So I haven't even decided what um, data structure is going to be used, um, but I'm going to be be implementing some of these functions to see if we can provide the, um, the, the stack functionality to this other program. So there's my header file. And let's have a think about what this header file does not give us. I mean, like, it's what it does give us, but also what it doesn't give us is important, right? So, the standard stack functions are there. We can add or remove, we can push or pop an element from the top of the stack. Um, we cannot get access to anything else inside the stack. So this is really interesting. There is no way, if we use those functions and that type def, there's no way we can look through the stack. So we can't go deeper into the stack. We can say we can only get the top element. Um, it's also said that we can only pop one element at a time. Uh, we can't loop through, yeah. So it's, it's interesting. We do have a, a series of elements in this stack, but we don't have access to any of them except for the most recent one that was put on the stack. So this is the abstract data type that stops us from accidentally reading things that we shouldn't be reading. So it stops us from accidentally going deeper into the stack. It says, no, no, the only way you can, you can get information from the stack. Actually, this is even more strict. You can't even look at the top of the stack in this particular implementation. Some other implementations allow you to peek at the top element of the stack, but this one just says, no, if you want to look at the top element of the stack, you have to remove it from the stack. So it's like a deck of cards. You cannot look at what the top card is without flipping it over, in which case it's been removed from the deck in a sense. So it's interesting that um, the rules that we put in our H file will govern what we can and can't do uh, with this. So, stack.c. We haven't created a stack.c yet, um, but we are going to create a stack.c 
so we've got the the headings in our header file and then um, what we need to do then is say that if someone was was to call that function what's actually going to run so the first thing I'm going to do is use a linked list as the data structure. Um, so now, now that we're actually in the C file and we're actually building things, uh, we start to think about, okay, now we do actually need to make these decisions. Um, the main file and the H file don't need to know about the decisions we made in, make in the stack.c. We just need to make sure that we kind of uphold their trust in the functions. So we need to make sure that the, um, the, the functions implement the rules correctly. Um, and I chose a linked list first because I think it makes sense in that a stack is a, um, a data structure which is not specific on the number of elements that are in it. It's going to grow and shrink. And a linked list is very good at growing and shrinking. So this should be an easy way um, for us to do this. But we can look at how to implement this with arrays. This is, this is time-based, how much time I have today to do this, but I think in my plan, because I'm, I'm only going to do a limited implementation of both, but I wanted to show you how the C file is so kind of decoupled from the main and so protected via its type def between the two that you can just interchange the entire kind of core implementation between um, different stack.c files and they'll still work with the main. And this is the reason why we don't give access to the data structure. Because if we gave access to the data structure on main, then the two of them are like linked really closely and there's no way to remove them. Um, whereas if the stack.c says, oh, I could do this as a linked list or as an array and you won't know the difference because you never poke into it, um, then we're, we're kind of freer to have these, these kinds of uh, parts of the code decoupled so they don't have to be really, really closely linked to each other. We can change things if we need to on either end. Okay, so what happens on the other side of the, um, the type definition is we have this stack internal. So the only thing we've been told is we have to implement a struct called stack internals. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have stack internals, which is a thing that has a pointer to the start of a linked list. And then we have uh, the actual stack nodes inside, which are the, the linked list nodes. Um, you may recognize this kind of structure and it's something that we use a lot of the time when we're wanting um, something to manage a linked list. So instead of the pointer being the first node in the linked list, um, it's the stack internals pointer points out to its own struct, which may have more information than just the head of the list. I mean, this is going to be looking familiar to anyone who's been working on assignment too, right? Um, the, we have a governing structure and then we have the individual node structures which are different okay let's actually build this so i am going to make a stack.c but i'm going to call it stack ll um because i'm going to do one linked list one and then one um array one so the linked list one is this stack um, I guess I don't need to say anything more than that here because every all the information about what's going on in here is actually in in the H file so as long as we're including the H file it should be fine <laughs> did you love it sometimes when you just forget the date and you're just like how long have we been doing this? <laughs> okay, so the first thing I'm going to include so that I know that I'm using it is the stack.h. Um, and I actually don't think I need anything else yet. I have to think about what other things I might need. But the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this structure and say that you wanted a pointer to stack internals, so stack internals must exist somewhere. So I'm going to make sure that that thing's built. And for the moment, the only thing that I'm going to use here is that this thing is going to contain a pointer to the actual stack nodes. And we're going to call that the head of the list. Funny thing that you can do, and it's very, very specific that you can only do this for pointers, 
is you can declare a pointer to a type you haven't declared yet. Uh, it's interesting and it only works because um, pointers are all the same. <laughs> I was I was about halfway through that sentence. I was like, that sentence is untrue. <laughs> but it's like pointers are all exactly the same amount of memory to store, and they store exactly the same information. They're not the same, but um, but all pointers are a sixty-four bit memory address. Uh, well. When I say 64-bit memory address, I mean that is dependent on the architecture and the compiler that you're using. But for the moment here, <laughs> this is a memory address. So I can declare this even though I haven't said what a struct stack node is yet. Um, there's plenty of other things where you can't do that, but pointers are okay about that. So I do need to also say what this stack node is. And the stack node is going to be a really simple linked list node. It's going to be the normal linked list node. So all linked lists are going to have some information and a pointer to their own type so that they can link to the next node. So let's do the pointer. Stack node pointer. And I'm going to call that next. You know, like to follow conventions when I'm building things. Um, and there's going to be an integer in it. Obviously, we could store more information here. Uh, we could store notes and octaves. <laughs> um, we could store other things like that. Like, you know, um, we're getting to the idea now that the linked list, the, the pointer is necessary. It has to be there or else this thing doesn't link together. But this here of the information that's being carried um, by this node um, can be all kinds of information. I can put massive amounts of extra code in here you know I can do stuff like this um, um, I don't know <laughs> arrays of integers you know like for the moment I'm only carrying one piece of information which is an integer like you know just a lot of the demos that I'm gonna do are gonna keep it simple um, rather than adding a whole bunch of stuff we didn't necessarily need. Unless there's a story behind what I'm doing. When there are stories behind my demos, then they get extra stuff because it's fun. Okay, so these are my structures. So now what I do and what I do when I'm building a C file is I what I usually do is I go through the H file and say, okay, what do you need? You need stuff, I will make stuff, right? So I've said you needed stuff here, so I made stuff. And it's more than just making stuff. I've made stuff that's actually going to work for what I need. And the funny thing about doing this C file is like we're so used to when we create a C file just doing this. And go, here's my running code. C file doesn't have um, an entry point for the program. It doesn't have a start that always happens. The only things that happen in a C file are we expect that these functions are going to get called, so we have to implement these functions. So there is no like starting off in the main and saying the program starts here, because that's already been taken by the main file. The C file is just individual functions and say, if those individual functions get called, we're going to, we're going to react properly to that and give you the code for those functions. Okay, so we got a type def here, and then we're going to be like, okay, so the first function is going to be creating the stack. So first function here, creating the stack. So what I like to do to make sure that I've got things exact, control C here to copy, control V to paste and say, yeah, I'm going to create the stack. I'm nearly, nearly at a point where I don't necessarily need a, a, a comment here. So usually I'll put a comment on every function, but like <laughs> this comment's going to be like, create the stack and it's like yeah I, I knew that thank you <laughs> it's called stack create what else is it gonna do so it's interesting that if you if you can reach a point where your um where your code is written so well that it's like completely understandable you don't even need um a lot of comments so you can get to the point where your comments are just like this is a confusing bit here's a comment, but otherwise you don't actually always need like a mass of comments everywhere. However, I will put some information in here because this doesn't have all of the information that's happening. So I did, I did want that comment because it's just going to say that is important information because it's not really given anywhere there or even here. 
but I know that if I'm creating a stack and I wasn't given any information, then it has to start empty. I can get away with this as well. This is going to be fine. In fact, I might even remove that because we don't usually put void in the input of functions. So I'm going to say stack create makes a stack that is empty. So in order to make the stack that's empty, we're going to need one of these, a stack internals. I need the stack internals to last longer than this function. So if I need something that lasts longer than this function, then I'm going to memory allocate it. If I'm going to memory allocate, so this is the funny thing. It's like, I need this. If I need this, I need this. If I need this, I need this. And stuff. So in order to start allocating memory, I need the standard library because the standard library has malloc in it. I'm going to malloc some memory. How much memory am I going to memory allocate? It's going to be however much memory a stack internals takes. So size of uh, a stack internals structure. Once this function is done, it's going to give me back a memory address. If I don't keep that memory address, I'm going to be in trouble. So let's call it new stack is equal to that memory allocation. So now I have created an empty stack internal. So there's no information in this. So this pointer doesn't have any information yet. So I'm going to need to give it some information to make sure that works. So my new stacks head should be null because there's nothing in it yet. I vaguely recall there's something on the slide which is more than this amount of code, but I don't think I need that. Or maybe the return, I need to return it. Return new stack. Okay, that should be everything that I need. Oh, it was the same amount of code. There was something there that was like, made me think there was an extra line in my slides. And I was like, dude, did Passmark think of something? But no, this should create everything that I need. So this is going to give me the stack internals, but no nodes yet. So the head's pointed at null. We do need to do this because pointers don't just default to null. Null's a specific value. So, so if I want to say that this thing specifically has no nodes in it, I do have to say it. Okay, so I've, I've created the stack and it's currently empty. I'm not necessarily going to go through my H file and implement these things in order because the freeing the stack involves me knowing exactly how it's built. So I might make these building functions, um, uh, adding and removing functions first, and then I might come back and do that. In this lecture, I'm probably not gonna come back because you know, I don't have enough time, but I'm gonna do the push and the pop here. So pushing items onto the stack. I'm going to treat my linked list in this way, this kind of vertical linked list. So the head points at the top element, which is the most recent pushed element. And this is the newest, there's older and the oldest, right? So the further you go down into the stack, the older the things are there, the earlier that they were put into the stack. The last element points at null. So if I want to insert an element at the head of a linked list, that's really easy. I already know code to insert an element at the head of the linked list. In fact, when we were, um, first looking at linked lists and I gave you only one function, which is the ability to create a node. Um, we already, with only the ability to create a node, we could already add an element as the new head of a list. So pushing onto the stack should be reasonably easy. We should be able to use that. And every time we push, it doesn't change the order of anything else that's in there. So let's implement this function. And here is where I would definitely put some comments in because I have not at any point here explained how the linked list relates to a stack. So I can say the top of the, <laughs> the stack is the head of the linked list. So this is where these comments come in handy because it's like, okay, we have these rules, but we haven't specifically said how we're gonna follow these rules. Okay. so. The top of the list is the head of the link. So the first thing that we need to do is, I should don't necessarily need comments for that. I'm going to create the node. I could do this in a separate function if I wanted to. Um, 
but for the moment this is not going to be super hard for me to do because um, I think I can just do it here by giving it certain um, certain properties as I build it. So I'm going to get a pointer to a new node exactly the same as I did here I'm going to memory allocate it because this linked list is something that I want to last I want it to last beyond the functions where stuff is created so that's why it's going to be memory allocated Again, this line should be starting to look pretty familiar. Anytime we're going to memory allocate, we take a pointer to a certain type, stack, stack node pointer, and that's the same type of the memory that's going to be created. So we get enough memory, size of is enough memory for a stack node, and then we get a pointer to a stack node out, out of that. Then I'm going to need to give new node some information so if it's going to be the head of the list then its next pointer is going to be equal to the stacks head which is good because the stack is a stack internals so that's this s the stack internals has a head so what i'm saying is the new nodes next points at the head which is if this had been the elements before I pushed the item onto the stack, this would have been the head. So this thing's next points at the thing that had previously been the head of the list. And then this new element is the new head of the list. So the head needs to now aim at that. Oh, <laughs> it's really funny. I just did this. Head is now equal to new node. Thinking abstractly that works. But I'm just like, which head? It's the head from the stack that we are currently pushing onto. So the stack's head is now the new node. So between these two, um, we have enough information to put that node in it. But we haven't actually given that node its, its data yet. So I'm going to say new node's data is equal to the item we've just been told to put on the list. I don't need any return from this because the stack is still the stack. I've already changed what is in S by changing what um, what its head points at. So, you know, like previously when we were doing linked lists, we had to keep passing the head of the list around in case it changed and stuff. That's the nice thing about having this stack internals. It's like, no, no, don't worry. We've got the head saved somewhere. And so we always have access to that list by that. And then we can change it. By, by doing things like this with the stack push. Okay, there's the code for it. Um, and then removing something from the top of the stack says the only node that can be removed from the top of the stack is the, sorry, the only node that can be removed is the top of the stack and it is the one that the head is pointing at. So I can remove this node and then I will return the value that I get out of that node and then the head will move down to whatever is next in the list. So removing the first node from the list, not too hard either. Um, you can see that a stack is really nice because a linked list gives us all the time, it gives us access to the first element of the list. And if the stack is only ever using the first element of the list, we never need to use it. We basically never need to, to delve into the stack at all. We're just doing all of our operations on the head of the list. So I've got some code here. Um, we do need to check something and it's a bit weird, right? Uh, we need to check if the list is empty. So let's write this. I always find it really hard to actually explain stuff while I'm typing comments. It's really hard to write stuff in English and talk in English at the same time. I find it much easier to write in code and talk in English at the same time. 
That's why you'll get moments of silence while I'm typing. Okay, so we're going to remove the head. So again, we're going to make it clear here that this is removing the head of the linked list, which is also the top of the stack. And that's going to return the value that was stored there. Okay, so what we need to do, if we're going to remove something from the linked list, we probably want to get its information first. Um, oh, no, wait up. Wait up. Okay, let me, let me show you what I was going to try to do. Um, I'll call it data because it's called data in it. Is equal to stacks heads data. Now, we can already see a problem here. What if there are no items on the stack? I've explicitly said you can create a stack with no items. If the head is null, we cannot access its data. It has no data if it's null. So we need to check first. Is the stack empty? If S head is null, then the stack is empty. We have a weird issue here now, because how do we actually um, deal with a, a stack that's empty? If it's empty and we try to remove something from it, that's impossible. So what do we give back? Every possible integer that I could give back will not tell our, our user or our, the other parts of our program that there's an issue here. Because I could say, oh, give back a zero. And it's like, yeah, well, what if I want to store a zero in the stack? It's like, okay, give back negative a million. It's like, well, what if I wanted to store negative a million? You said I could store any integers here. So there's no return value I can give back, which is going to show that there's an error. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go full, <laughs> I'm going to go full on here and say that because there is no value I can give you, which will tell you there's a problem. I, I'm going to, I'm just going to nuke the entire thing. So what I'm going to say is, um, maybe I will do a printf. And just at least let the person know who's, who's trying to use this, that there is definitely a problem here. You can't pop from an empty stack and now I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to blow up the entire program. Oops. Exit one. <laughs> now this is a keyword that you can use if you want to in um, in C, which just says the program finishes here. And so I'm not even in the main. Um, I'm in a function that the main's calling, but this is going to say the entire program is going to stop. So I might want to use this like only under the direst of circumstances. Um, this is going to um, to end the entire program. Um, in order to do that printf, I'm going to need to include standard IO. If you ever forget to include things from the standard library, don't worry, your compiler is going to let you know. It's going to be like, what is that? You know, I have no idea what printf is. And you're like, oh, come on, of course you know what printf is. It's in all of my programs. And it's like, no, 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 it's not because you didn't put this in. So it will remind you, but um, that's something we forget a lot. Okay, so this thing is going to say we're out um, because there's no way that we can give back useful information if the stack is empty. Again, this is why I said it would be handy to have something like this for stack size so that we could check the stack size before we made a request to pop an element. Anyway, so if um, the stack is empty, we're going to exit the program. Otherwise, we're going to say, all right, we, if it's not empty, that means we can get some information from it. So, um, retrieve data from the top of the stack, remove the head of the stack. Okay, so I'm going to use my basic um, removal code here, and it's going to be quite easy because I know it's the head of the stack that I'm removing. So if I'm doing that, I'm going to want a stack node pointer. Um, I'm going to call it rem node. I like to call it sometimes to call it specific words to remember that this is going to be removed. Rem node is equal to the head. So I'm going to say that whatever the head of the stack is, don't worry, I've already taken its data out of it, so it's now able to be removed. So 
I'm going to say the rem node is the head. The head is then going to move on. So if I go back to my slides here, so I, let's say I had this element and now I'm removing this element. So the head was pointed at it. I'm going to say, okay, I've taken this and um, I'm about to remove it. So the head pointer must skip this and go down to this element and then this thing will get removed. So the head pointer skips the current head and goes on to its next. So pushed elements next goes here. So head should point there. So head is equal to head next. Um, and then the rem node there, I've taken the information out of it already, so it can be freed. Then this function was going to give us back an integer. So I can say, yes, I know which integer it is because I retrieved it from this before I destroyed it. So I can return the data there. So basically what I did was first thing, if it's empty, blah, nothing we can do. So we're going to throw the whole program if it was empty. Um, then we're going to retrieve the information from the head and then we're going to remove the head. So again, the comments there should tell you kind of what we're doing. Um, so I've written a lot of code now. I should probably test even if this compiles. I should have compiled this in between. Um, so we have a function that creates an empty stack. We have something that adds an element to the top of the stack. It can add to empty or to, um, or to something that already has stuff in it because all it's doing is saying point at the head and then the head points at me. Um, and then the pop is saying get the information and then remove the node that had the information. So let's compile this and see what mistakes I've made. I'm just going to clear that. Um, so DCC, and I'm going to DCC both of the C files. It actually doesn't matter which order we do these in. So I could do the main first or the stack first, but either way, I'm going to call it stack demo. All right. Uh, how many he's behind you? Oh no, people didn't notice. Did people notice? Not necessarily. So we're, we're getting to the point where the, the code is getting complex enough that people aren't necessarily noticing things. So I said head is equal to head next. It's like, what even is head? Head should be the stacks head. So this should have been the stacks head is equal to the stacks head next and the stacks head. This is really funny. Um, I don't know if you've ever, I don't know, it depends on how much you ever speak to people whose first language is not English, but they've learned English. Um, they may make um, weird grammatical errors and you're like, wow, why did you say that that way? And it's like, when you, when you understand their native language, you go, oh, of course they said it that way. That's how the grammar works there. I just did a C++ ism where the head would usually be accessible because all of these functions would actually be connected closely, more closely to the data structure than, um, than they are in C. So that's why I just said head. Well, there's obviously only one stack, but there isn't obviously only one stack. There is a specific stack that was given to this function, which is one I should be using. So I think, I think that's okay now. All of the, the heads of this list are based on the stack that was given. So let's try that again. Okay, so the stack demo is working. Well, it's compiling. <laughs> Here's my main. So let's see if this works. So I'm putting the card 42, then 37, then 13 onto the deck, and then I'm taking these off the deck. So let's see what order they come out in. Well, let's see if this thing runs. Stack demo. Okay, cool. So we put 42, then 37, then 13. And then taking them off from the top, we get 13 first, then 37, then 42. So this is potentially working. Uh, always the way that I'm going to... Um... Whoa, that's weird. Sorry, I just saw this. Use of undeclared identify head. Did you mean Fred? Freed? Okay, I was wondering why that word came up. No, I think that must be another uh, standard function somewhere. Okay, so these things, this seems to be working correctly. The push and the pop are working correctly. We're adding to the top of the deck. 
and every time we take off something we get the most recent thing so last in first out was the rules so the stack says the most recent thing that went in which is the 13 is the first thing that comes off then the next most recent the next most recent so my stack is functioning reasonably um reasonably well there um i'm not going to go too deep into this so um because it's 1235 and i want to show you a um an array implementation of this because there's obviously other stuff to do here that I'm not necessarily going to be doing it. So here's the testing code. I put different numbers in the lecture slides. Obviously you can put any numbers you want, as long as they're different from each other so that you can see um, the, the push and the pops. So what are the other things we could have done? Um, we haven't destroyed or freed the stack. So if I was going to keep running this thing, um, actually I'm not leaking memory yet. Like I'm only leaking memory when I stop using the stack entirely. Um, but because every time I removed an element from the stack, I was freeing the memory. So I'm doing some memory management, but I'm not freeing the entire stack. So we are at risk of leaking memory. Um, I haven't yet checked the number of elements and yeah, this would be super handy because come on, Jared, you can do it. You can do it. All right. I was going to say, I was going to look at the code and, um, the exit error, that, that hard exit um, issue. We don't really want to come up against that, you know? So what would be better is if we checked how many things were in the stack before we were popping it. So we say we only pop items off the stack if there's at least one item in the stack. I'm just gonna go back to my slides now while, while Gedit figures out what's going on. Okay, the thing we now want to think about is different implementations. So stack c did not have to be a linked list right it just happens to be a linked list but it did not have to be one if anything we do implements the functions in stack.h our main.c is not going to know the difference so let's think about um storing our stack in a in an array instead of um storing it in a linked list because we can totally do this because arrays I mean, in a way, arrays can grow and shrink. So long as we have like a maximum size, then we can grow and shrink within that maximum size. We've seen this in strings. Strings are like, no, we don't have a specified length, but we just have a marker point for where we end, which is the null terminator. And we can do a similar kind of thing um, with an array implementation of a stack. So I'll show you the way we're gonna do this. We have an index called the top of the stack. And the top of the stack is going to be uh, an index somewhere in the array. And what I'm going to say is the top says where the data is finished. So the top index is exactly the same as the null terminator. It's just easier for us to get to because it's going to be a number instead. So the nice thing as well, the top is exactly how many valid elements there are in, this, in the array. So the array stack is going to be big. It's going to be bigger than we think we need to use just in case people start adding lots and lots of things to the stack. So it has a limitation. The limitation is going to be how much memory did we declare for this array at the beginning. Um, and that's going to be a decision made with a lot of programs that you write. It's like, how much memory do I want to use to make sure this thing is safe? And then you end up with programs that use way more memory than they need just to be safe. And other programs that use way less memory they need to be to, to, to take up less memory and then they crash. So it's hard to decide where you should be on this scale. So anyway, we'd have a big array and this array can add numbers to it and it can remove numbers from it and it knows where the data ends based on this integer. So what do we have? Yeah, this is the bit I wanted to talk about here is like, we want to avoid ever hitting this code here. Um, so if we had, I was talking about the previous things, if we had a stack size, we could avoid that because this main could say, all right, I'm always going to check the stack size before I do my pops. Okay, so we had our linked list implementation. Let's start work, uh, working on an array implementation. I'll just call it dot .a, linked list or array. Okay, so we've got another file here and it's really gonna be like, we could compile it against this implementation or we can compile it against this implementation.
feel like this comment I should like record as a macro and just play the macro back on like my keyboard or something like that because because that would make that much easier okay first thing I'm gonna need to do is say that I am going to implement the stack dot h so I need to include it so stack dot h and I'm gonna need my stack internals I think I've got some slides to look at before I get into that um, so that's my implementation. My stack.c is going to have stack internals. So as I said, it's going to have an array that has the information for what's in the stack, and it's going to have an integer, which is an index that says this is where the top of the stack is. So stack internals. I know that I have to have a stack internals um, because it's in the H file. And it's interesting, right, because we had two structs here for the linked list, but I think I can get away with only one struct for the, um, for the array version. So I'm going to have the array of data. So it's an array of integers. I'm going to call it stack data. Um, I need it to have a specific size um, because it needs to be, like, big enough. But... It, it needs to be declared in advance. I can't just declare this as a, as a random value. So I'm going to use my hash defines to say that the max stack size, I don't know how big it needs to be. I'm going to pick a programmer number. <laughs> you know, we like, we always work with these, these weird numbers like this 1024 to, um, 2048, um, Six five five three six. <laughs> I've memorized way too many of those. Um, is it six five five three six? It is. Yeah, it's a five digit one. Anyway, <laughs> those are all multiples of two that end up being things that we use. That's why I like things are like thirty two gigs of something, sixteen gigs of something, and stuff. There, they always work in multiples of twos because then there's absolutely no wasted information because everything's in bits and everything's addressed in bits. So we end up with these um, multiples of two everywhere. Sorry, not multiples of two, squares of two. Um, but anyway, I've chosen 1024. I could have chosen 1000 and it would have been fine. But on instinct, I went for that. This is way bigger than we need it. But, you know, um, it's just integers. I'm not using up a super amount of memory, so it'll probably be okay. Um, what we can say is that this one will definitely use less memory than this one. Uh, but at this point, we're not optimizing for memory usage just yet. Okay, so... This is this big array, and then we've got another integer, which is the top of that array. So let's also implement the stack create. A lot of this is going to look reasonably familiar um, because we st still need to memory allocate for the stack internals. So, um, oh, I can use capital, yeah, stack new stack is equal to malloc. I think this might be exactly the same line from the other program or the other implementation of this. Oh wait, I can't use capital S stack here because capital S stack is a pointer to a stack internals, not an actual stack internals. If I was to malloc the size of a pointer, I'd get 64 bits of memory. This is way more than 64 bits of memory here. So it's gotta be the actual struct itself that I'm allocating memory for, but then I can use a pointer to it. In fact, I'm gonna change this so that it's the same as the thing in the size of, so that we're really clear that's exactly what it is. I don't think I did that in the previous version, but that's okay. Okay, so if we've allocated this, we don't actually need to do anything with this array, because this array has whatever information that an initialized array has in it. If I wanted to, I could set them all as zeros, but I don't think that's important because the top is gonna tell me that there's nothing in it. So my new stack, top is equal to zero, which means there's no elements in it, which means none of the information in this array 
is actually meaningful to us yet. Um, if you look at my diagram here, the top is the first element that doesn't have any information. So if the top was pointed at zero, it would mean that all of this was kind of colored in orange that I've done for the diagram, which means it's meaningless. So even if there is information in here, I'm not using it. Okay, so the top is zero and we return the new stack. Okay, so that's actually all we needed for our stack create. Um, now now let's look at the pushing and the popping onto this stack. So I've got the stack create there. The push should add an element that is the next element after all of the elements that are currently in there. And the pop should return the element, which is the last element in the stack. And we're going to use that by moving this top index around as we do things. So if we're going to push an element onto the stack, here's the top is five. So this is, I think the same one as before. And I want to add 82 to the stack. So 82 gets written into the stack at the tops index. And now there are six things in here, which means top should be six rather than five. So the top moves up one after that. So this is pretty simple. It's like, we've got the top, we write over whatever data is in here. We don't know what data is in there. It might be previous elements. It might just be gibberish because we've only created the, the, the stack recently, but it doesn't matter because whatever was in there goes, we're going to overwrite it with this current number. So we go, index five, overwrite that with 82, and then move the top up one. So push should be reasonably easy for us to create. Stack push. So again, when I put the comments in here um, for the implementation, this gives us information about this implementation and how it's going to be doing things. So I say stack, stack data. This is the array and I'm accessing an element of this array, which is the, um, whatever the top is pointing at. So stack top. So the the top index of this array then becomes the item. I think that might be the only thing that I need to do. Oh no, do I, I have, I have another issue. I have a slightly annoying issue is that I do have a maximum stack size. So because I have a maximum stack size, um, I could be, um, I could be in an issue where I'm trying to add to a stack um, that can't actually fit any more elements in it. So I might need to check for that. And this is going to be a similar kind of situation as previously, but harder to avoid. Um, so if the top is greater than or equal to maximum stack size, we have run out of space for our stack. So this is this is quite dangerous, right? Because there's nothing we can do in this situation. So we are going to have to exit again, but but this is one that we wouldn't even be able to check for in a sense, because max stack size is um is here in our C file. And it's not something that we're gonna put a limitation on in our H file because other implementations wouldn't have that limitation. So this is something where we'd have to say there's an issue here. So we can't push another element onto this stack. Now this is a void function. So it's not even giving back any information about this. If I wanted to, I could potentially have this give back an integer and the integer that comes back is a code for whether this thing worked or not. Maybe we'd do something like that, but maybe I should also just say, look, we can't deal with this situation. <laughs> <laughs> this one, maybe if I wanted to be more careful with it, I could do something better than that. Um, because I could probably say, I may not even need to exit. I could just say that that thing that you tried to push did not end up on the stack. So whether or not I need this exit or not, I'm so, so on that. 
but I'm going to leave it in there for now. So the only other thing is, if we did have space for it, then we add that item. So we've done this bit, we add the item, and then we need to change the top to reflect that the top of the stack is now moved up one. <laughs> nice one, Hamish. Hamish just said, so the stack overflowed. Exactly. This is, this is like that. This is a stack overflow. I should just say something with maximum stack. So this, this is, this is what a stack overflow is. Um, well, not exactly, but you know, going outside of the stack. Um, and when you have programs and the whole program is in a collection of memory, if you can get outside of the stack, then you can get into other parts of the program and you can potentially edit it and stuff like that, which is why a stack overflow is super dangerous. It can, um, it can break your code or it can be used as like, I don't think they really work anymore, but it used to be used as like a, a hacking attack, like a code injection attack. If you can get out of the stack, then you can rewrite other bits of code. Anyway. Stack is, I'm changed this to Stack is Overflowed because of like the, if anyone doesn't know, there's a website called Stack Overflow, which is like one of the, the biggest repositories of questions and answers about code in the world. Okay. So this push is going to add the item and then it's going to move the top. Let's look at the pop. There's the push code. I think I had the same thing there and I exited. Yeah. The pop is going to say that this element here is the thing that needs to be removed from the stack and we need to get this information. So what we're going to do is move the top down one. Once we've moved it down one, it is now pointing at this. So it was index five goes to index four. It's now pointing at this number. We can read this number. And after we've read the element and the top is here, we're going to consider that it is no longer part of the stack. It's really funny because in the array itself, the eight is still well and truly there. Um, but we can't ever read it again because the rules of, of popping says that this is always going to move down one before it reads something. And if we were to add something to the stack, we would then overwrite whatever's there. So what I'm showing you is like this array can have values in it. Like this array still has the value eight in it here, even though we've popped it, we don't necessarily write over it or anything yet. Um, we just don't consider that it exists anymore in the structure of the stack. So it's interesting, like we actually have a history of the stack still in these orange cells, but we're not considering any of these to be data that we're using because only the only the elements before the, in, the index top are considered to be part of the stack. So let's write some code for that. I've got some code here, but I'll write it stack.h so you notice that everything that I'm implementing here using the stack.h um, is the same functions it's only what's in them that changes and you know this quite well because all of your assignment code is likely to be very different from other people's assignment code but you're all implementing exactly the same functions uh, So one thing we do have to watch out for again, very similar situation. Um, if we don't have any elements in the list, I'm not going to do equals. I'm going to do less than, I know that it's very, very hard for this thing to get below zero. Um, but I do like to, instead of checking for explicit numbers, check for the entire range that's invalid. So if that's less than zero, uh, no elements in the stack. I'll do a printf here. Cannot pop from an empty stack.
we have the same issue where we're like, okay, if we can't do this, we're going to have to just like let this go. Otherwise, what we're going to do is go back to my diagram. We're going to move the top down one and we're going to read the element from there, return it. That's all we have to do. This actually, the step between here and here is just like a figurative idea that we're no longer considering this part of the stack. So, oops, S top minus minus moves it down one. And then we're going to return the integer that we find in the array. S's stack data at the index of top. I did it again. That's top there. Note how we haven't really done this before, but note how now we're happy to use arrays alongside structs and pointers and things. So we've got these like pointers to a struct inside the struct is an array and we're using, um, elements, uh, fields from structs as indexes and stuff. So there's all this stuff that we're doing now where we haven't really gone back and looked at arrays that much since we did strings. Um, but you can see how you know how to use arrays, you know how to use structs and pointers and things. You can just combine all of these things together. And so we can go back and do array based things with our new, more complicated thinking about stuff. All right, I'm going to save that and, um, gonna see if there's any oh people are asking about exit um the the code in the exit i put a one in there so it's not a zero so exit zero is if you make it to the end of the program and like this is a code that the program kind of signals as it finishes so i said one to show that it is not the same as zero so it's a it's an error if i wanted to i could actually have different numbers for each of these different types of issue so one might be popping from an empty stack and i might have two as overflowing my memory or something so that way if i was looking which we don't usually do you know when we run it here it doesn't actually tell you how it exited um but if i was looking at the exit code i'd be able to see zero meant it exited correctly one meant that someone tried to pop from an empty stack and two meant that we ran out of memory and had a stack overflow and so this one never really does that. If it runs out of memory, the whole process is going to get killed. We saw what happened previously. So we're not going to get time to try to, um, uh, to try to send an error message when that happens. Cause the, the operating system is not even going to let me run any further when I try to malloc here past my eight gigabyte limit. Um, but this one we can identify as we've trying to pop from an empty stack. Okay. So the pop here says we go down one and then we return whatever data that we saw there. Save that. I'm going to compile this now. Instead of the linked list version of this, I'm going to use the array version of this. I'm going to overwrite my stack demo. So I'm going to make a new program, um, which for me shouldn't look any different, but underneath it's actually doing very different stuff. Uh, assuming that I haven't caused some problems. Um, Oh, I'm using malloc and I have not got the standard library. Yeah, okay, so that's an issue. As I said before, if you forget to include the standard libraries, it will remind you. Uh, I know that I needed um, input because input output because I'm definitely calling printf if there are errors. Okay, so hopefully with those two we can compile. All right, so now when I run my stack demo, it is using the array implementation of the stack, not the linked list version of the stack. All right, 42 goes on first, then 37, then 13, 13 comes off first, then 37, then 42. I have a correct implementation of the stack my main can't tell the difference between these two implementations. I mean, sure, if I push 1,024 things, oh, sorry, 1,025 things onto this stack, I will notice the difference at that point. But until then, and if that number was high enough that I never really, never reached it in my general usage of this, I would never have a problem. And so what I've done now is I've created two different implementations of this abstract data type the data type remains 
abstract and the main and the h file never kind of uh, knew or had to care even about what was happening in the c file so long as the c file was actually helping and doing things correctly so this is this is really cool right because of the trust in the h file um the main function never knew what was going on. We used two completely different data structures, completely different implementations, and they both work. So that's what an abstract data type is. It gives us the capability to say, here's a set of rules for this thing. As long as you follow the set of rules, uh, nothing else is important, you know? So you make your own decisions about how the implementation is gonna be made. Um, I'm already over time, but I just wanted to say one or two different things. Um, stacks are obviously not the only abstract data type. There's another concept in programming called a queue, which is like nearly exactly the same as the stack. It just stores information, but it's a first in, first out. So you could say things that go in first are the, the first thing that, that, that comes out rather than the most recent thing that goes in is the first thing that comes out. Um, if you want to, you can look at, um, the implementation of the stack there and change it so that it's a queue. It's actually really simple, just a switch for um, where you remove from either of these implementations. So yeah, lots and lots of things with abstract data types. You can do, say, um, beat rep representations in a music synthesizer and stuff like that, just as a random example. <laughs> yeah, so I should wrap it up there. Um, so that was just an extension on um, what we were doing with multi-file projects and showing the idea of abstraction, which can come in quite handy. So I've gone over time. I should finish the lecture there. Um, I will go into be right back mode and I'll come back in a second and answer any questions that people have. All right, I'm back. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if anyone noticed, but I forgot to refill my cup <laughs> halfway through the lecture. So it was like the second half, I was like... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I got a question there from Blake. What's the difference between abstract data types and data structures? Well, an abstract data type is about... Um, a set of rules around a data structure, um, which is like saying that a stack is a data structure with a set of rules. An abstract data type is a way of building that stack so that someone can use it without knowing what it's made of. But a data structure is nearly like a wider concept in a sense, like we would think of a, um, an array as a data structure. Um, we think of particular structs as data structures as well. Um, we can think of a linked list definitely as a data structure. Like they're all, those are all data structures. And a stack is also a data structure. 
but a stack can be made as a, an abstract uh, data type. And a stack is abstract in its um, in its idea because it's a theoretical concept, whereas a, an array is is I guess it's also a theoretical concept, but an array is very much a um, an implementation. Like so, the I think the way that you could think of it, if you want to really define it is that an abstract data type is a data structure that doesn't have set rules on how it's implemented. Um, but there's heaps of data structures out there that also don't have set rules on how they're implemented. Like you can do a linked list in a um, in a language that doesn't have pointers. So you can you can have ways of um, knowing what other things are that aren't pointers. So we have other languages that have references that are not explicit memory addresses, in a sense. So so it is subtle because every abstract data type. Oh no, that's a big call. A great deal of abstract. I always like every time I say an absolute one way or the other, I say, "Oh wait, wait, wait!" I can definitely think of an example that this makes this not true. But a great deal of abstract data types are data structures, because um, a great deal of them involve holding and managing data in some way. Um, but when they're abstract, it means that they are an idea with a set of rules, but they're not a not a concrete implementation. <coughs> Whereas an array as a data structure is something that we would consider to have a concrete implementation. But you could look at arrays in different compilers and they might be different. So the implementation part that we see uh, might always be the same, but that actually might be an abstraction of the truth. Um, because you know how I kept saying, like, and this is really funny, like fundamental thing about um, 1511 that I've always been saying is that um, arrays are one block of memory. Arrays are guaranteed to be one continuous block of memory. Uh, physically, on your RAM in your computer, they might not be. Your operating system might have mappings between parts of your RAM and parts of the RAM that's physically there. Um, because the RAM that's being used by your computer might be too fragmented for you to get a good chunk of it. So it might be that underneath somewhere there's an abstraction where we think it's one block of memory, but it's not exactly. And these details are things that we like, won't always really dive into. Like, personally, I never dive <laughs> that far it's like that when it gets that much closer to hardware um that's where me personally i don't i don't understand enough so i will back off at that point and say i know that someone else is dealing with this and i trust them and again that's abstraction again is like saying that um the operating system is like a giant h file that says let me handle this this mouse cursor for you there's a whole bunch of functions in there. There's a whole bunch of hardware connection. And I'm like, I don't know. I let someone else deal with that, right? So abstraction is really interesting like that. Um, yeah. So the <laughs> interesting question about, you know, the difference between abstract data types and data structures is that sometimes there's no difference. Um, sometimes there is a difference. Um, but it's always a little subtle. So I guess... If we want to draw a, um, a Venn diagram of this, it's like, it's like this, I guess. I just made like a little, like just because the colors, it's like a little chicken. I'm going to put eyes on this. Anyway, <laughs> so, so this is like, all data structures and that is like abstract data types I don't know if this is even accurate because I'm pretty sure you can make abstract data types that are not data structures they're not specifically data structures they're just like a capability for doing something but it's sort of like this <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> That's a nose. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's move on. I think people might have some actual questions they want answered rather than me just doodling in Microsoft Paint. 
<laughs> okay, okay, okay. Where was the question? Pauline <laughs> was asking, during the exam, is using VS Code with SSH fine or we need to log into VLab? Um, we will... What's the call it? We, uh, it'll be similar to your labs and stuff like that. So if you've been working with um, VS Code and SSH, then please continue to do so. Like, we don't want you to have to change too much of what you're doing for the exam. Uh, the submission and stuff like that is on our system. So as long as you're SSHing and for your DCC and stuff like that, you should be fine. Um, uh, our queues part of the final exam, uh, reasonably unlikely, but possibly, because we might actually be doing one or two queues questions in the lab. I mean, it'll just be like the idea that like a stack is one thing and a queue is another, but we won't go too deep into it. Um, like you may or may not have to implement it. Like, even if we like, even if we ask you something like that. So if I asked you to, um, order information based on the times in which you saw it, that's the kind of question I might ask you in the exam. So order this information so that when you use it, you use it in the same order it came in. And I might just ask you that. I don't ask you anything else. I don't mention the Q word or anything like that. And I don't mention linked lists or arrays. I might just ask you something like that. And then you'll be like, what kind of structure could I put together for this? And you might implement a Q by mistake, or you might implement a Q because you specifically know that you're trying to implement a Q, but um, it's not really specific, you know? just realized I was covering up text. Oh, wrong one. Yeah, so so we could ask you a question that is about stacks and queues, but even if you had not seen the concepts of them, you'd still probably be able to implement it. So if, because if I just said to you today, before this lecture, if I'd said, um, can you make me something where um, I can add elements to a list um, and then I can just say remove and when I say remove, what I mean is the thing that went in most recently. You would have come up with a similar implementation to mine. Or even a different implementation to mine, that's fine. Um, yeah, so when, when I say stacks and queues are going to be in the exam, they may be in the really hard questions in the exam with something like that, where it's just a vague idea of it. Um, we may also put them in the super easy questions in the exam of something like, um, I've definitely done that before, something like looking at this and going, what if I say I have a stack and then I leave these three lines out and you have to tell me the order that these things come out? Um, I've asked questions like that before. So do you understand the concept of what a stack should do? Okay. Uh, and Blake was saying, yeah, so something like a tree is both an abstract type and a structure, but a struct is like a full on data structure. Yeah, because a tree is, is, is a structure um, but the, how you implement a tree depends on the situation, you know, so you can implement trees in nearly every programming language. Um, you will learn about trees later. Uh, a tree is a, Joanna, you can help me here. One, five, two, one, maybe. No, no, no. Two, five, one, one. <laughs> I just, sorry. I would, I would actually, I know it's never going to happen, but I would probably prefer that we, we never talked about the numbers for the subjects and we talked about the actual titles. So there's a data structures and algorithms course, I think, which is 2511 or 2521, I can't remember, you know, but we always end up referring to them by their numbers because the numbers are quicker to say. Um, but I, I, I would love it if mine was like intro to programming, if everyone just said intro to programming instead of 1511. But that change is not gonna happen. <laughs> but that would make it easier for me to describe this. Like I know there's a course that continues data structures. And the first thing that we'll do in a course like that is to take this tr uh, this this linked list that we have and go, your, your linked list up until now looked like this. But what if we did this? And it's like, oh, mind explosion. What happens? How do we how do we control something like this? And it's like, yeah, okay, whole extra field of computing. Because then we can, we, with this kind of structure, we can say, if we go from left to right in this structure, we're going to end up at one of these. 
And then how do we decide whether we go up or down in each of these situations? Really, really cool. Lots of cool stuff going there on there. Okay. Um... Okay, so let's go back to questions. It was 2521. Thank you, uh, Willie and Joanne. I was like, 2521 is the one with the trees and the graphs and stuff like that. Um, I enjoy that kind of stuff, but I mean, that's that's because that was some of the stuff that I worked on. So I did a lot of um, stuff on game playing AI and things like that. Um, okay, so other questions there. Just rolling back a little. Uh, Joanna was answering stuff about the cues. Oh, same thing that I was saying, I think. Um, Noel was saying, I mentioned something a while back about skipping one week of lab exercises if we had to. What was that about? I'm not encouraging this, but I wanted to know. So your lab marks are based on, there are, how many labs? Seven or eight? Eight, I think. Because it's week two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten. Eight. I should have counted that with that. Yeah, eight. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Advanced computer science <laughs> has done years of working in an in industry and can't count to eight. Yes, so there are eight labs. You will get your seven highest marks for those eight labs. So if you have to throw one, you can. I don't suggest that you do because um, throwing those marks means that... Uh, um, you know, I mean, I would suggest going back to it because you're going to need everything in every one of the labs in the exam. Um, but in terms of marking it, we just want to make it so that if you have a really bad week or something like that, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily tank what is basically your participation marks for this course. So the labs are your participation marks. It's not the same as like an attendance mark, which is where you can get ticked off and then fall asleep in the lab. If you fall asleep in the lab, which I know some people do, um, you can you can still go back and finish it sometime that week and get your marks. So that's the participation kind of thing. Um, so yeah, so it's meant, meant that like if, if you attend 90% of the course uh, in terms of the finishing the content for 90% of the week on week content that's enough yeah oh well lead was asking because cues were previously part of 1511 um and we haven't really taught it so yeah cues are not going to be like super deep into what we do but um they're useful to know about though still um what was I going to say? Yeah, because I used to do two lectures on these abstract data types, like one which was stacks and the other which was queues, and I realized that that, like, is not teaching you much. You know, what's what's better is to teach you actual programming concepts, and the concept that we're teaching you is abstraction, not stacks and queues. Um, and so the next lecture, instead of it being just a continuation of abstraction, is going to be on recursion instead, which is uh, a, a slightly different topic, which is a, a way of thinking inverted thinking about programming um well lead was like cues are a different concept why teach stacks yeah so if i was only only going to teach one of those i would always always teach stacks because cues are very easy to understand so making an ADT for a queue first in first out we know how to queue because we're human humans stand in queues you know like we we kind of know that one whereas stacks are how programs work which is why I wanted to talk about stacks rather than queues because um, I think that one of the most important um, slides in this lecture is this one uh, understanding what the call stack is this is something that's going to reverberate through your programming career understanding which part of the code is currently being accessed by the computer, which part of the code is ready to start running again once this one finishes, and how we build and and um, uh, like push and pop from our call stack as we add functions and as we return from functions. Um, so that's why stacks over queues at this point in time. I mean, you're gonna end up learning them both eventually. Um, in fact, even just mentioning that queues exist and that they are a first in first out data structure and having gone through all of this implement implementation stuff for stacks today um, I would not 
I, I would have a great deal of confidence that anyone who watched the lecture today could implement Q. So if you if you if you're watching the lecture and you do have an understanding of how this stuff works because you're you're up to date on on both linked lists and arrays, I would uh, I would say that I would have a reasonable amount of confidence of a student being able to implement uh, queues. Implementing a queue as an array is the hardest combination of all this stuff though, because the queues walk through their data structure because you put something in, um, and then you remove this thing. And then you put something in, you remove this thing. And so if you're going to do it in an array, you'd actually have the, the both ends of the queue as indexes in the array, and you'd slowly walk both of them through the array. So you've got to deal with hitting the end of the array and coming back, which is weird. Okay. Um, Joanna was saying, yeah, there was once a graph question in the exam. So yeah. Um, the hardest questions in the exam will not just test exactly what I've taught you, they will test whether you can use what I've taught you in ways that I haven't taught you. So can you take everything that I've taught you about programming so far and spin it into a new concept? Uh, so, I mean, it's they're there for a reason, right? Because like you can still happily pass the course and and go on to a fulfilling career <laughs> in computer science without even attempting the later questions in the exam but if you're if the rest of the course is stuff that you know really well um i'm still going to test everyone in the course so there's some people in the course who, who have fully understood everything that i've said uh and congratulations if that's you because it's pretty hard to do um and I have specifically said that it's not necessary to to have a full understanding of absolutely everything that I've said. But there's going to be some people who are at that level, and so everyone gets examined. Um, that's why there's a lot of questions in the exam, but in order to pass the exam, you don't have to complete all of the questions. So we should be getting to this mindset now that, like, um, in general, and this is happening in life, right? And happening in life and work and stuff like that. Um, you may get asked to do a lot of things. You may have the capability to do some or all of those things. If you work within your capability, you will still be able to do what you need to do in your life. Um, and there's a lot of the times where unreasonable demands are put on us and, and what we can do in those situations is to say, okay, the best I can do is this. I will still do the best I can do. I'm not going to shortchange people or anything like that. But at the same time, um, this, like the completion of whatever I'm working on doesn't have to, um, doesn't have to cost me. It doesn't have to cost my mental health and my physical health or anything like that. So there's, there's a line that you learn to draw and you can be like, I'm happy enough with what I'm doing. Don't have to do everything. Um, and there's plenty of situations where you're like, I simply do not have the skills for this. Um, if you want me to do this particular job, I will, <laughs> I will need three years and another degree to do this. But if you want me to do it now, I will do what I can with it. So it goes, it goes like that, you know, and like, you know, we see it all over the place. Anyway, <laughs> I'm digressing. Um... People, I got to, I got up to the point where people were laughing at my um, at my little person here. Um, oh, Joanna was talking about there was a graph question in the exam once, which is a, a graph is the idea of multiple nodes with multiple pointers going at each other. It didn't have to be implemented as a graph question, but there there has been a question in the past. Um, All right, just catching up on the chat. Oh, well, Lead was asking a question about if you've done all the labs, um, what's the suggestion to revise and prepare? So there's actually going to be extra revision questions out there. Um, there's the weekly revision questions. Like, I'm not sure how many people have been looking at those. Those are definitely good to go back on because they're, 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 you know, specific to the topic just previous. So if you go through all of them, they should kind of look at every week that's happened and say, okay, this is the kind of thing that was being covered that week. There's not that many questions in those. There's only like three-ish questions. So um, it won't be extensive coverage. Um, but yeah, they're pretty good as well. Um, people are talking about um, HackerRank uh, questions. There's some stuff on HackerRank which is similar to what we're doing. 
you know, in terms of like, um, can you understand how to work with a linked list and stuff like that? There's questions like that there that you could look at. Um, for those, I think um, you you want to look at what they're asking um, and see if it sounds like the kinds of things I've been asking. Because if it isn't, it might be something we haven't taught or something that hasn't been covered yet. Um, and then you may be accidentally doing like, I don't know, second year uni programming work with, that you didn't need to. <laughs> and you'll be like, why did that particular question take me like three hours? The whole exam is like three hours. I'm not going to be able to survive if I can, if it takes me three hours to answer this question. Um, but that's because the question is something you haven't learned. And every concept we've taught, um, we've taught you for more than three hours at a time. Like every new concept that I teach you, I will deliver two hours worth of lecture and then you'll have three hours worth of lab. So you're not really expected to be able to handle a new concept unless you've done like five hours on it. Um, and so that's the, that's the rough idea. So if you're doing a hacker rank question and you have no idea what's going on and it's taking you five hours and you'll be like, maybe I need to check whether this is even in the course you know, because studying, yeah, it's, it's much harder to study using outside materials because you don't know whether that's actually part of the course or not. Um, and Blake was saying, yeah, if you've done all the labs, you're actually probably in a decent position. You can go back over them. Yeah, Joanna was saying the same thing, going back, especially because if you, like, week one and two, there's not that much stuff there. You should still kind of know that, but some from kind of week three onwards there's there's going to be stuff in there where you'd be like oh that was how we did that you know like today when i just hopped back into arrays and i started using arrays alongside structs and pointers and you're like oh okay if we combine all this stuff together it's actually quite interesting um yeah i think joanna's got a lot of um uh, a lot of good advice there i uh, if you want to be fast in the exam or even just fast encoding in general um just doing more of it <laughs> is good so syntax gets better the more exposure you have to it and joanna linked a uh, lead code thing there as well okay um and we're talking about recursion for for friday yes recursion is when you use recursion that's good i always had a whole bunch of jokes in, in my slides for recursion about it just being entirely self-referential. But this time, uh, Tom is going to be delivering some of the content for that. I'll be here with him. Um, um, but so I'm going to let him write some of his own slides for that. Okay. Oh, <laughs> Blake asked what's on my shirt today. It's the... Um, what is it called? Is it... I can't remember the number. Is like 50 visions of Mount Fuji? Um, this is the Great Wave, so it's just like this, it's probably one of the most famous artworks that exists in the world. I actually have another one here, hang on. Eh. It's on my desk behind the camera. Um, this is another artwork in the same series. Um, oh, I forget, I forget the artist's name. I apologize because like when... When names aren't in a language that I know well, I tend to forget them. But this the, this particular artist did all these woodblock um, prints, and so like it's like it's, it's one of the things that I like. Like going to going to visit Japan and seeing stuff like that. It's very cool. Yeah. Ah, you have it in Animal Crossing. Yes, the real but not fake one in. Animal I think I got that one in Animal Crossing as well. I did not. Um, I did not go and collect all the artwork in Animal Crossing. I feel like collecting all the art in Animal Crossing is like a months long exercise. And I played Animal Crossing quite thoroughly. Well, from, from my thinking quite thoroughly for about two or three months. And I was like, okay, I'm good. Thank you. I'm good. I was talking about doing some, some casual streams at some point. So maybe week 11 or maybe week 12, maybe after the exam's over. I will do a, a stream because I thought um, I thought I might do something really funny because I talk about human resource machine all the time. So I thought I might stream me playing human resource machine. It's basically me streaming um, me programming an assembler, and it'll be really funny because then you get to see like how good a programmer I actually am, as opposed to like when I do lectures and stuff. This stuff's all prepared. 
you know. So, like, whenever I'm coding in a lecture, I'm pretending that I'm live coding. But what I'm really doing is, like, writing programs I've written before. And, yes, I remember them reasonably well, but not perfectly, which is why they're not always the same. I also take advice from students as I'm writing them so that they're not... They're actually built organically, not just me me kind of repeating stuff that I've done. But I think it'll be interesting if you get to see me thinking in real time about programming. And I think what will be um, hopefully a huge confidence booster for a lot of people is that some of you are better than me. <laughs> you will be able to see me thinking about stuff and just be going, I can see the answer. How come Mark can't see the answer? And it's good because like a, a lot of people like uh, treat lecturers like they're a level above like it's like this is like this this human and then there's lecture and it's not even not even remotely true like um i look at the marks distribution for com 1511 and i look at the exam questions and i write exams and assignment questions and stuff like that and i think about myself as a student and and, and look at the course and go yeah i think i would have gotten maybe maybe a distinction in this course when I was a student, if I was lucky, it would have been somewhere between credit and distinction, maybe. And, and, and it's interesting because people assume that because I'm lecturing the course that I must have gotten a hundred in it when I was a student. I was like, no, that is not the case. <laughs> right. So, so I'll do something like that. I will, I'll schedule it later. And, um, yeah, as we'll lead, say, you can just yell, he's behind you. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, I'm going to wrap it up there. I don't think we have any questions anymore. I think we've just been talking <laughs> randomly now. So um, I will see you on Friday for a kind of special edition of 1511 where we're going to invert the way we think about programming and we're going to invert who's, who's lecturing as well. So it's going to be Tom lecturing and I will be assisting him instead. All right, see you all Friday.